the first point that comes out of here is what is it? Trust. Trusting reason. Um, reason is a gift from Allah. And Allah describes the gift of reasoning as something through which we understand his revelation. In fact, Allah describes his revelation in the Quran and the revelations in creation, the ayat of revelation and the ayat of creation as being for people who use their aql. For people who would think. For people with lub. Lub means brains. For people who will contemplate. Allah assumes that this revelation that is coming to you you will be mentally alert to benefit from it. One of the interesting uh, points about the relationship between reason and revelation is explained by a great scholar, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, where he says, the relationship between reason and revelation is similar to the relationship between the eyes and light. <coughs> to say you are going to use your reasoning and you don't want revelation is like somebody moving around with their eyes open but in the dark. To say you are going to go with revelation and I'm not going to be reasonable is like moving around in broad daylight with your eyes shut. You will find the furniture with your shin. You will bump into things. Eyes are a gift as light is a gift and they work together. Quran is a gift to guide you but so is reasoning a gift to guide you, not just to the Qur'an, but to guide you in learning the lessons and applying them to your life. In fact, Allah asks the question, are people like cattle that they don't think? There is a concept in Islam called taklif. What you call maturity. That a person whose reasoning is not working well, is not considered liable in Islamic law. So they even have a hadith, number of them actually, but one hadith where the Prophet said, the pen that records sins does not record sins for three people. A child. Why? Because he can't reason well until he has reached an age of maturity. A person sleeping, why? He can't reason, he's not conscious. So what he does in that state, it's not really his fault. A third, an insane person, somebody who has got a mental problem, until they gain their sanity. In other words, the whole concept of right and wrong, this is a sin, this is not a sin, doesn't apply if your reasoning isn't functioning well. There are certain things called the maqasid, and we will come back to this subject. These refer to the objectives or purposes of Islamic law. Does anybody know these? Can you remember one of them? Life. Protection and enhancement of life. Very good. Another one? Religion. Property. Religion. That's three. Akal. What is akal? Intellect. Reasoning. That the protection and the promotion of the mind and the faculty to think is actually a whole objective of Sharia. 
Are we together on this? Yeah. So it's not a joking issue. It's actually a whole of the five classical makasid that all schools of scholars take. They call them the daruriyat hamsa, those absolute five necessities. The protection of life, the protection of faith, and its enhancement. The protection and enhancement of family or lineage, the protection and enhancement of property, and the protection and enhancement of the mind, of akal. It is because of the protection of the mind that alcohol is prohibited. Why? Because it befogs the mind. So we find the protection and the enhancement of the mind is another objective of reasoning. But scholars have been a bit afraid of allowing reasoning to lose its way. Um, and so they have tried to find a proper role, position for reasoning that makes it sound. There's good reasoning, there's bad reasoning. So the, there's a whole subject where scholars are thought what you would call critical thinking. Not just logic, but the interplay and of reason and revelation. It's a subject where juristic reasoning is regulated. When a jurist is reasoning, what is that called? Anybody? Juristic reasoning? Ijtihad. Okay. When the Quran is silent on an issue, and the Sunnah is silent on an issue, and the Sahaba knew nothing about it, they didn't exist at their time, you still want to know, is this in line with or against the Quran and the Sunnah? But how are you going to answer that question if the Quran and Sunnah is silent on this issue? What is the kind of reasoning that the Sahaba operated with? By the time they have spent their lives, the Quran being revealed in their presence, they spend their lives with the Prophet, the Prophet passes away. When a new issue comes, how do they reason? That type of reason guided by the Quran and the Sunnah and the objectives of Sharia, that kind of reasoning is called Ijtihad. And a mujtahid was the highest qualification a scholar could reach. That's the highest qualification. That was the highest qualification where it now became okay for you to do ijtihad. Ijtihad meant the Quran was silent, or the Sunnah was silent, or they were ambiguous on a topic. And you're going to come up with an answer representing the Prophet in his absence. That's not a joke. So they developed a field called Usul al -Fiqh. The principles, the Usul, the roots, the foundation of Fiqh. Fiqh comes from the Arabic word Faqqaha. Faqqaha means to understand. This subject dealt with the foundations of our understanding. How we understood things. What was considered evidence? And how strong was it? And how certain were we about any particular evidence? It's a big field. But the key point here is the scholars realized there was the need to have criteria. for what was right and what was wrong. If the Quran said something was wrong, no problem. It's wrong. If the Sunnah said something was wrong, no problem. When there was silence, what did we do next? So they have these tools for thought. They call them the secondary sources of Sharia. One is Qiyas. 
Okay, we will not go into detail. But one is chaos. Chaos means analogical reasoning. Reasoning by analogy. Alcohol intoxicates. Cocaine intoxicates. If alcohol is haram because it intoxicates, then logically, by analogy, cocaine should be prohibited. But alcohol harms, cocaine harms more. So should the punishment of alcohol also go there? No. We have enough of an analogy to say this is intoxicating and it is haram. But when it comes to what punishment, this is greater than this. It's not Quran or Sunnah that said, what do you do about cocaine? It's logic. It's understanding why was this prohibited. And so when we look at this field, another point that scholars make, and we will make this point quickly, is reasoning plays a role in the verification of the authenticity of text. Prophet said, that doesn't make me follow it. How am I sure the Prophet said? There's a whole field of hadith sciences that have been established with logical criteria that can mathematically determine is this from the Prophet or is it not? And if you say it is, with what level of certainty? They wanted a hadith to pass at least five criteria. Number one, sorry, at least four. It should have a chain of narrators of people linked with each other. You can't just tell me somebody, where did you get it from? Um, I tell you, I got it from the Prophet. Who did you get it from? You don't believe me? Who did you get it from? You don't trust me? Now I don't trust you. Yeah. So they want a complete chain down to a Tagi, down to a Sahaba, who said the Prophet said. That's number one. Number two, they want a chain where everybody is a person of integrity. So they were interested in the bibliographies of these people. Who are they? What was said about them? So there's a whole subject called Ilmur Rijal, where they study the biographies of the individuals in the hadith. There's no hadith that is called Sahih, and people don't know this person. The moment they don't know that person, they will say, we don't know this person. That already weakens the hadith, and it's no more Sahih. It belongs to another category. Or, we trust everybody, but there's a missing person. What do you mean, missing person? Well, Hassan al-Basri, who was a tabi, said the Prophet said, but Hassan al-Basri didn't meet the Prophet. Yeah, but he met Ibn Mas'ud, but he didn't say I got it from Ibn Mas'ud, he said I got it from the, he said the Prophet said. Yeah, who told him? We don't know. They call that a mursal hadith, broken chain. Why? Because it's not complete. They don't call that sahih. So they want a complete chain, they want everybody in the chain of known integrity, they want that this chain comes up with information that doesn't contradict anything that we are certain about. If it contradicts any historical facts, then we will not trust this line. Human error somewhere. If this hadith contradicts something in the Quran, sorry, human error must have happened. We're not going into this field, but basically, they will look at what they call the mutton, the content of the hadith. What is it actually saying? And even when a hadith has passed all those tests, yes, this is a full chain. Yes, they are of sterling character. And yes, what was said doesn't contradict anything in the Quran or the Sunnah. They ask, do we have any other witnesses? They ask, is the hadith garib? Garib means only one person heard it from the Prophet. Or is it Aziz? We've got up to two independent chains, at least. Or is it uh, Mashur? Three or more chains. 
or is it Mutawatir? So many multiple independent chains that it is impossible for people to have fabricated it even if they wanted. Then they say, that's a mutawatir. That has reached the kind of standard the Quran has reached, mutawatir. So many independent chains, so many narrations for every single verse that nobody argues on, is this a verse of the Quran or not? Whether they are Maliki, Shafi, Hanafi, Hanbali, Shia, Zaidi, Ibadi, you say, bring the Quran, recite anything, anybody can complete the recitation of the other. That's the Quran. Without spending too much time, reasoning plays a role in determining authenticity of text. In understanding the meaning, observe, what does it mean? Why? Because it was, it was said in human language. So should we take it metaphorically here or literally? Should we interpret this on its own or should we put it in the context of the whole verse? Reasoning plays a role in trying to understand the hikmah, the wisdom, and the purposes of mafasid. Reasoning plays a role in the application of revelation. A verse of the Quran says, you cut the hand of a thief. That's Quran. And nobody argues about that. Umar bin Khattab understands the Qur'an more than any of us. During the time of Umar bin Khattab, there's difficulty. It's a period of famine. So he suspends the cutting of hands of thieves. Why? Because he knows applying that punishment in this context would not meet the objective and the wisdom behind the law. Some other people steal. They stole a camel and they slaughtered it. And they were apprehended, they were caught. They were brought to Umar, he was caliph at the time. Umar tried to find out why they stole it. And it transpires these people were slaves of one gentleman, or not, maybe not too gentle a man. Uh, and he wasn't taking good care of them. Umar asked the person whose camel was stolen, what's the value of your camel? He says 400 dirhams. Umar tells the master, these people stole because you are not taking care of them. I will give you a fine, pay the man 800 dirhams. Hopefully, you will not repeat your mistake again. If these people repeat stealing for the same reason, it is your hand that will be cut. You would have said, wait a minute, who stole? These guys stole. Quran says if you steal, cut the hand. What's this complication of the water just cut their hands? But reasoning that helps you understand the wisdom of the law helps you understand when to apply it. Reasoning also played a role in the defense. Of truth. When people got reasoning wrong, influenced by one philosophical argument or the other, and got lost, how did you build, how did you pull them back on the straight path? By using superior reasoning. So when people started getting confused by Greek philosophy and missing their way, what scholars like Abu Hamid al Ghazali did was to go and study that for at least two years, until the scholars of that field acknowledged he's a scholar in philosophy. Then he wrote his book, The Refutation of the Philosophers, and he refuted their arguments. Why and how? Because he was now an authority in that kind of reasoning, and he could now use superior reasoning to bring them back on track. So. Point number one that I would like us to remember here, trusting reasoning. The more reasonable you can be, the better you can reason. The better you can guide your reasoning, the better you understand Allah's will. 
Otherwise, you come up with, forgive my language, stupid teachings, and you still want to say that's Islam. You know, like everybody can like, what's wrong? Well, it's in the Quran, well, it's in the Hadith. And why are you insisting? Because you are suspending the use of a gift that scholars have validated as an objective of Sharia and has been guided.